so, you know, we talked about things like transparency and all these kind of things uh, and interactions with our schools. You mentioned about, you know, secrecy and, you know, teachers' involvements and stuff. And while, again, let me reiterate, we, we're not talking about every teacher, uh, but it clearly there are those who have become activists on these issues. Uh, and then there are probably those who are going along to get along because of uh, threats. Uh, they're afraid they're going to lose their job. They're afraid of the consequences that may happen to them. Uh, have you had conversations? I mean, you've been very involved with your school and so forth. I mean, have you had any conversations? Are you have you delved into that space? Uh, let's talk about that just a little bit, uh, and then I'd like to shift a little bit into. I know that you've formed an organization to to help parents with this stuff. Let's go into that some, and you know what what you're learning, what you've experienced, what you are doing to help parents in these situations. Well, let me start out with. Um the fact that there are many teachers that are also indoctrinated and they have been told relentlessly that they are ch saving children's lives by keeping these secrets from parents and promoting this transgenderism. And I do believe that many of them believe in their hearts of heart that that is true, that they are preventing suicide because they are told it and they are not told the other side of the coin. Um, but they need to actually understand that this is different than a child being gay. And it gets very conflated. Nobody wants to be on the wrong side of that. This is very different than, than years ago of, of parents not supporting, you know, their, their gay children. Um, so teachers owe it to their students to actually understand what transgenderism is, first and foremost. If they want to safeguard children, they have to understand that parents are there 365 days a year. We don't leave after three o'clock and we don't leave on the weekends or over Christmas break or, or summer break. We need to be in the know. And, and teachers who are doing this, they know what they're doing is wrong, you don't have an excuse. I'm sorry. I'm not forgiving in that realm at all. Lose your job for a child. What would you do for a child? Morality wise, you can get a new job. You can file a lawsuit. There is no excuse to hurt a child like this. Zero. Um, and there are lots of law firms that will take your case gratis to file these suits to protect children. I mean, what is more precious in the in our lives than children? And we and we are the only people who can protect them. We adults and we are required, compelled to do it regardless of the financial cost. Um there will be more jobs for you. Um so I think that's I, I think it's really important for people to stand up. The time is now. Um and parents, I just want to talk a little bit about what parents can do to protect their children. There are books out there of uh, Raising Your Child in a Transgender World by Aaron Brewer, Brewer um, which is a book I would recommend. Um, parents need to know what is going on in their schools. I was naive. You need to be in that classroom and you need to look at every book that's on that shelf. You need to read every assignment before your child does the assignment. You need to go to that school and, and pop in on those classes. You need to um, not use the school iPad. Again, these are costs, but the schools are tracking these children through their iPads. You need to opt them out of every course that you can opt them out of. Every survey, opt them out. That is your right. You find out a third party is coming to speak at that school, you pull your kid from it. Know about these euphemisms, UBU clubs or equity clubs. They sound nice, but know what they're being taught. A lot of the schools are hiding these, these classes now. 
They have the classes at lunchtime. Be in the know. I mean, it's insane to me that we actually have to be so involved at the schools to, to, to make sure that the teachers are not teaching our kids gender ideology, which they are. Like, look around the classroom and see if your child's name, if there's a different pronoun. Send in requests for records. That's your right. Find out what your child's name is being used at as school. These are your federal rights. Pull your kid from the public school if you have an inkling that this teacher may be an indoctrinator. It is painful. It is expensive. But what would, what would you do to save your child? bodily integrity, you'd pull your child out. Um, money talks. You talked about the money. Each one of these children is worth over a million dollars to the medical community. They are lifelong medical patients. And they have a higher uh, likelihood of suicide post-transition. They don't talk about this. They use these surveys to make up these numbers. The numbers are just not true. The real numbers, okay, so sorry, I'm going to get a little deep, but there's a study of four gender clinics um, in the United States. They're supposed to be, you know, the biggest, the most premier, whatever we want to call them, the experts. 315 kids went on uh, cross-sex hormones or puberty blockers. Within one year, two of them had committed suicide. That's over 50 times the average for that age group. So is this life-saving? It is not. It is life-ending. And people need to hear that and understand that, that they're actually setting up a child for failure if they um, push this ideology. We're going to have massive suicides 10, 15 years from now. The detransitioners are growing as fast as people are transitioning. And and I work with them. Their sorrow and their physical pain is real. Yeah. Yeah. So you started an organization, if I understand correctly, called Our Duty. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I did not start it. Um, It was started in the UK. Um, It's an international group of parents and advocates. Um, I am the co-lead in uh, the Western region of the United States. Um, And it is a group that uh, offers support for parents. We also offer to find attorneys for people who are willing to sue, um, both with detransitioners, parents, um, you know, kids who were harmed, Uh, We also do a lot of advocacy um, in that we hold rallies. We're going to have one in May. Um, We're going to the Pediatric Endocrine Society in San Diego um, because they are the ones meting out these poisons into our children. Um, We testify. We put together parents who are willing to talk to the press. We write letters. We do a lot of advocacy to raise awareness um, and get people moving because there's no one coming in to save us. This, this, I, I know you talked a little bit about politics, but you know, this has been pushed as a political issue. It's not, um, the Republicans seem to be fighting for it. The Democrats, the rank and file Democrats were against this. Nobody's listening to us. I go to Sacramento weekly as a Democrat, 37 years as a Democrat. And they basically, they do, they ignore us. Um, they don't, you know, they want to move this into a political thing that we're, we're bigots and we're hateful because it helps, it helps continue this um, horrid, horrible, you know, things to our children by, by saying it's a Republican Democrat issue. It's not, it's child safeguarding. And anybody who who loves a child should be fighting. I totally agree with what you're saying right there. I mean, politics wants to swallow everything and make it a political wedge issue. 
um, these things, uh, we, they become political, but they are not at their core political. They are ethical. They are moral. They are, uh, they are societal, communal, family, uh, centric. And I think what, what, what is absolutely critical, and I appreciate the work you're doing to try to uh, make awareness, to try to help organize and mobilize uh, parents on these issues. Um, that's so important. Uh, what we are finding is that uh, many parents, uh, they're concerned, but they don't know where to start. Uh, they don't know what to do. They don't know who to reach out to. Uh, and our basic philosophy is, look, talk to your neighbors, talk to the people closest to you, make it as local an issue as possible and fight for change where you are. Um, you know, engage, uh, as a community, you know, come to agreement on what's the right thing to do, what you are, what you will accept and what you refuse to accept, uh, particularly as it relates to our schools and what our schools are teaching or what our schools are hiding or, or any and all of those topics. And at the end of the day, um, even in our schools, there is a way that parents and as citizens that we can get the upper hand. And it really boils down to be becoming aware, organizing and networking around your values, and then taking action around those values. So, you know, school board members are really the, the stewards of our schools. And, uh, if the school board members will not stand up and, and force our schools to do what's right for our communities and our families, then they need to be replaced. It's really, really simple. It means we run people who share our concerns and our values, and we replace those who don't. And we provide resources as an organization here at No Webster Educational Foundation for school board candidates and all of those kind of things. Um, bottom line is we believe that it's the parents who have the ultimate authority and responsibility and the most interest in the well-being of our children. Schools do and can, but far and away, it's the parents who have to lead that conversation and own that conversation and make sure that we're doing the right things for our kids. I couldn't agree with you more. And look, I'm, a, <laughs> I'm not an advocate by trade. I didn't go to school for this. Um, I just did. And that's what I tell parents. Just do. Just go to that school board meeting. You get two minutes. Bring some friends. Start talking. Be brave. It gets more comfortable. Courage begets courage. Yeah. So as we're kind of moving into close here for this session, uh, first of all, thank you for being with us today. I, I really appreciate you coming on. This is a difficult thing to talk about because it's very personal for you. Uh, tell us what you'd like to about your own journey with your daughter, how things, if you've, if you're, if you're seeing light at the end of the tunnel uh, on this, uh, I know these are ongoing processes and we can't ever really pin it all down, but talk to us about some of the, some of the hopefulness that you have and have experienced. And then uh, just kind of talk to parents out there who are listening and it may be grandparents who are listening. Uh, and, and what can you encourage them with? So I am very hopeful with my daughter. Um, she's only 16. So I've got a long way. Uh, we're also in California and the pull of the transgenderism is everywhere. It's in advertising. It's at the grocery store. It's on TV. It's in movies. Um, it's in their phones. Um, but I'm, you know, optimistic that 
um, her comfort in her female body will stick. Um, but I have to admit, I'm terrified. Uh, I sleep with one eye open and I don't know where to send her for college if I do send her for college. So these are these are real issues um, that I, you know, I, I won't I won't sleep soundly until she's 25 and that frontal lobe is matured um, where she understands long term consequences. But for parents out there and grandparents, it's really important for them to hold the line. To them, for them to be the voice of reality with love, compassion, and understanding that these kids really feel what they feel. Like it's not funny, it's not a joke. Um, they're they're caught up in a in a cult, and when they're angry, you have to go back for more. You have to take the anger. That's your job as a parent. We are not supposed to be friends with our children until later in life. They can hate you. That's okay. That means you set up boundaries. You need to hold the line, uh, take over control of that phone, over the internet. It's hard. It's painful. But you have to do it, especially if the kids are young. You have a great opportunity to reset your child. You also have to give your child an off-ramp because... Again, these kids get love bombed when they're trans. They become untouchable. They become special. Um, they become brave. And maybe they can't do that change staying at the same school. So you have to maybe pull them to another school. Um, you're going to have to throw some money at the issue, even if you don't have the money. It's better to take that college fund and use it in a way to get your child out of this, go on a long vacation where, um, you know, she or he is working with his body to understand how amazing the human body is as it is. Um, use your extended family to help you. Don't be afraid of following your gut. The gut is always right. Even if you say, oh, I can't do this. She's going to be angry with me. Let her be angry with you because she's going to be angry with you later when you let this happen to her. And they want your child. It's your child. Remember that this is your child and it's your obligation to give your child the future. Aaron, you are sharing some very powerful things with us today. Um, no doubt uh, there are people who are listening uh, who are grappling with this issue, or they know somebody that's grappling with this issue in their own family. Um, and so I want to ask you, uh, do you have a contact that you could share uh, that they could reach out to you or to other entities to get help? So for parents who are, and grandparents who are looking for support, if they have a gender confused child, uh, they should join parents of rapid onset gender dysphoric kids. That is a support group and it's done state by state. It's a national group. Um, I lead our Northern California group. Um, and that's more for, you know, getting um, advice on how to handle the day to day. There's also partners for ethical care. Um, that's an advocacy and support group. There's my group, which is ourduty.group.com. Um, we are more of an advocacy group. Um, there's also uh, uh, Advocates Protecting Children, which is another support group. And then for science, if you want to get understand the science behind this, I would go to um, segm.org. Um, it tracks all the scientific studies, what's happening in Europe, um, what puberty blockers do, what cross-sex hormones does. So there's a, there's a lot out there for parents who are looking for words on how to get their child out of this. I would recommend uh, detox, desist, um, D-Trans, a book by Maria Keffler, 
I used it to help with the words that I needed to say to my child. Um, There's also a podcast called Gender, the Wider Lens. And that gives a lot of advice on how to talk to your child. Um, I would look at detransitioner videos also to understand how the children got into this and how they got out of it. So there's a lot out there now, which is amazing. When we entered this forum, there wasn't a lot of literature written, and now there is. So there's a lot of help. Uh, Don't feel alone. You're not alone. There are thousands of us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that's excellent. And uh, we'll have the team put this in the program notes for this episode as well. And so uh, if you're a listener and if you're looking for help and resources, uh, we want to help you every way we can. Uh, so take a look at the program notes, pick up those resources that were just shared with you and, uh, and keep at it because your child matters.